We face challenges in terms of imminent legislation on telephone tapping, bank privacy, and the exposure of personal data. Many people don't like those trends, but it tells you again of the clash between freedom and security. We have issues like border security, drug and human trafficking. We have a culture of lawlessness across the Caribbean because we are bringing in alternative systems of justice. They're all trying to secure the first imperative of law and order. And we get carried away by bringing alternatives and substitutes, and thereby through financial resources and policy attention, ignoring the commanding imperative for maintaining law and order. Not repression, law and order. And I think we have to revisit our policies because that seems to be something that is sliding on the scale. We have a number of issues in school violence and delinquency. So we really need radical improvements, to put it simply. My own approach as a teacher and in the new methodology is to emphasize the role of social psychology in explaining criminal behavior. Because social psychology, briefly, gives you the opportunity, not only in terms of definition, the relationships between people, between individuals and the environment, but it tells you that how the environment influences people and how people get stimulated by things that they imagine, if not actually happening. So it takes you into the realm of symbolic interactionism, but more than that, it gives us the opportunity for criminologists and agents in criminal justice to become agents of change. Because in social psychology, it also tells you, explains, and points the way how you can be an activist in your community. I believe criminology and agents in criminal justice have been a bit too withdrawn in public debate and getting more involved in the public domain. Because if you don't, others will fill the gap. And they do so with very superficial analysis and propositions. There is a United Nations World Bank collaborated effort that, that is produced in a report on crime, violence, and development in the Caribbean. It was published, I believe, in 2007. Why do I refer to that? It tells you again about the fallacies that global analyses can cause to countries like ours and for people who do not understand the difference between situationally driven reasons for crime and using global analysis for policy making. In the 10 point summary of this report, that the statement reads as follows. If Jamaica and Haiti reduce its rate of homicides, each will see an increase of 5.4% GDP annually. Not 5%, but they went so far to specify 5.4%. It is more than a mystery. It looks so supernatural in my view. First of all, the relationship between GDP and homicides is still very questionable. There are too many intervening indicators, and there are too many cultural and contextual variables. And I will illustrate that to you in a few minutes. So these, you know, it sounds nice, 5.4%. It's like magic. But it is in the need to give global inferences that I believe drive such fanciful statements with due respect to the authors. Because I was one of the advisors on that report, but I was not responsible for this statement. I dealt with other issues in the report. But the report itself, when you peruse the hundreds of pages, it falls short of dealing with context and cultural variation. Things which are very important for society like the Caribbean. From Jamaica to Guyana, you will see cultural nuances and institutional variations that really are major contributors to the phenomenon of criminal behavior and institutional defects. The macro indicators, yes, poverty, unemployment, even discrimination, GDP. But between those macro indicators and the behavior itself, there is a myriad of factors that really need to be considered in the Caribbean as with other parts of the world. So let me now 
get to some of the slides here. Yeah. Yeah. This is a statement that is driving my own attention to policy making. I am saying that if you want to develop a Caribbean criminology or some theory of criminal justice in the Caribbean, even for teaching, not only for research, for teaching, we have to look at the functions of our institutions, how our institutions are functioning, meaning more precisely and more importantly, the police, the administration of justice. Because people feel crime is caused, quite commonplace, by poverty and so on, family breakdown, yes. But human nature, human behavior is also guided by consequences for behavior. If you know if you do this, that will happen to you, that anticipation of a consequence will determine whether you'll repeat that wrongdoing again, and vice versa for positive behavior. But we have a weakness in consequences in this country. Our case, some cases in the courts across the Caribbean takes eight, nine, ten years. Witnesses disappear. Some are killed. How can you have a justice system when a case and a victim have to wait eight, nine, ten years? And when you have laws in the book that are not really enforced, and when you have sentences that are imposed by the judges, are also not enforced. And whether you want it or not, whether you'd favor it or not, across the Caribbean, with very few exceptions, you have on the books the death penalty, but it is not enforced for different reasons with the Privy Council intervention and so on. What that means in total, and related to the institutional effect, is an unfortunate loss of public confidence in our institutions, and unfortunately on the government itself. So when you have a loss of public confidence alongside weak institutions, you know the pathway to disaster is not too far unless you make some of the radical changes that the chairman and other people will point to.